because there has been such a different ballpark in the numbers. That's why gaming companies have totally dismissed uh, ASR as a solution for this problem. But now when the technology has advanced, now we're starting to see the most innovative uh, gaming companies actually building systems for monitoring voice chats in real time. And they're seeing massive impact on reduced toxicity there. And that's something that I'm expecting that's going to really be proliferated in the industry. And in one to two uh, years time, it will be as, as widely spread as text chat moderation is today. And today I have Otto Sutherland from Speechly joining me to talk about this. Hey, Brent. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Well, I'm really happy to have you. I think this is one of the most interesting applications of speech recognition that I've seen come, come along in a long time. And one of the things that we did is we collaborated to learn more about what consumers thought about voice chat in gaming. Because, you know, frankly, there's not a lot of information out there. We know that a lot of people use it or we have the sense, uh, but we want to put some data behind it. And so the first thing I want to do is share some data here. And that's what we're really going to talk about today. A lot of it is what the consumers are telling us about voice chat. And so we thought we would start with the fact that 68, almost 69% of gamers actually use voice chat. So this is a higher than I think a lot of people believed. Yeah, absolutely. This was a big surprise looking at uh, what, what the discussion around the industry goes. And what's very interesting here is that actually the regular use for voice chat is actually pretty high. So when you compare this to, for example, the text chat, um, text chat um, there the regular use is significantly lower. So I think that this was very interesting. And what makes it even more interesting is the fact that if you consider that, that text chat is pretty ubiquitous in mobile, but voice chat is not yet then imagine what the situation is It's in the domains where voice chat is widely used. It's regularly used and it's used by significantly the uh, majority of, of gamers. Yeah, I was really actually surprised at this because I thought text chat would have been much higher in terms of use, you know, particularly with that idea of mobile. So I thought that was that was definitely an interesting finding. Now, the next thing that I thought was interesting, we asked gamers about how much they like voice chat and Particularly, I like games more when using voice chat and how much they agree with that statement. And look at this, 48%, almost half of people agree with that statement that they do like games more. This is across all gamers. This isn't just about voice chat users. All gamers, they like it more. Yeah, this is this is fantastic. And this is this is what anecdotally um, I've been hearing a lot from the industry, but this is really quantifying it. People really love be, the ability to actually be social with their friends while playing games. So, so this is really, really cool. It's very widely used and enjoyed. Well, that's a great transition, too. So the, so the question always is, is like, OK, how are they using it then? And we think about games becoming these social experiences as opposed to just entertainment activities as they have in the past. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is this point that about half of people are mostly using voice chat with friends. Now, I've had a lot of conversations with people in the industry, other people who play games, and they think that it's probably much higher. They think people are mostly using this with friends. But we see right here that about 45% of all gamers are using voice chat to connect with people who are not their friends. It's like to expand their social network. Yeah, and it's it's funny because oftentimes the problem, the severity of the toxicity problem in gaming can be downplayed by saying that, hey, it's only with friends, your closest friends. But that is actually not true. And this, I believe, is the first data that we have actually proving that point. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have this idea that people, a lot of people like voice chat, but there's a problem. So I was surprised at how high this was. I guess I've talked to some people in the industry that weren't surprised, maybe because of the games that they play, but this is all gamers. So their experience with toxic behavior. So how many have been victims of a toxic behavior incident in voice chat? Half of all gamers, 49.4% of all gamers have been victims. Yeah, and imagine if you would exclude from this data the, the players who don't use voice chat, of the players who actually use voice chat, 70% or three quarters of them actually have experienced a toxic incidence. So that's a pretty big problem, I would say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, it seems like this is, a, this is a, a significant problem. And let's look at this. This was another really interesting <laughs> finding. Okay, so we have here, 
the different channels of potential toxic behavior in, in gaming. So you have in-game play. There's certain types of things that can happen in the game that's not part of comms. It's just like playing the game, the game mechanics. Text chat, obviously. People are well aware of this. Voice chat. Um, and then we have user-generated content. Image uploads, audio uploads, video uploads. Okay, great. Look at this. Voice chat is by far and away, consumers say voice chat is by far and away the biggest vector for toxic behavior in gaming. What do you make of this? Yeah, well, I think what's pretty interesting is that if you look at the other categories, all of these other categories actually already have solutions in place to, to react and detect the, the toxic behavior, but voice chat is behind in that one. So imagine how this chart would look uh, after um, different types of um, tools for removing this toxicity will be implemented in, in voice chat across the games in, in, you know, in the next few years. I believe that these charts will look totally different then. Yeah, I would think there's only like one way to go in this place. And it is really fascinating to me when you think about this idea of uh, text chat. We've had tools for a long time that do keyword spotting. Everybody knows this. You do real-time redaction. Some are actually even more sophisticated than that and are actually using some actual AI as opposed to some other algorithms in order to make text chat more palatable and you know think about spam removal all these other types of things which are really important but one of the things that i've been doing lately is talking to a lot of game makers in the industry and almost none of them have any tools at all for voice chat so they have these text chat tools and i think that's a really important point that why is it the worst it's because they're not doing anything about it because they don't actually have tools in place yep yep Absolutely agree. Crazy world. <laughs> okay. So the other thing we thought we would do is compare this to text chat. So we found that text chat and voice chat users are about comparable in terms of Greek gaming. Um, are they comparable from a toxic behavior standpoint? Well, the answer is no. Uh, what we found is toxic behavior incidents by offense categories. We started breaking this down like you know, bullying, trolling, sexual harassment, stalking, doxing, all these different things that can happen that are bad. And if you look at this, the Toxic behavior incidents in voice chat are somewhere between 50% er, and 200% more common. So the, they're that much higher frequency in voice chat than text chat. Yes. And what's even more alarming is that, that when you look at some of the biggest categories of, of uh, toxic behavior in voice chat, those are actually the same ones that have the biggest impact on churn and negative word of mouth. For example, for stalking and sexual harassment, over 50% of the victims actually have significantly, uh, they have stopped or significantly reduced their gameplay after experiencing these kinds of incidents. So I would say that the situation is pretty alarming now. Yeah. And, it, you know, another thing that I thought was really interesting was that a very small percentage of gamers who have experienced toxic incidents actually have reported the incident. And so we looked at this idea of complaints because that's because they don't have monitoring generally. Uh, so the gamer, the game company generally doesn't know what's going on unless there's a complaint. But when only just over a third of gamers who have experienced these incidents, they've ever filed a complaint. Uh, that means that there's a big gap here. There's a massive gap because what this means is that we have only scratched the surface. It's kind of like we've only seen the top part of an iceberg where most of the toxic behavior remains totally unseen and unreported. And what makes this even worse is that when you look at the data of the people who actually do report these incidents, they say that they do not report at all all of the incidents. So meaning that, that most of people don't report any and the people who report only report a fraction. So that means that the clear massive majority of all of the toxic behavior gets totally unnoticed and unreacted to. Yeah, I think that what that tells me just looking at the data is that the best case scenario, something like, uh, you know, 35% of incidents are reported. But actually, if you dig deeper into the data, it looks like something like single digit percentage of all incidents are actually reported. And I think we'll have more data on that coming up from actual evaluations, you know, some of the other things that I know that you've been doing in the industry. But, you know, I think of this as like that, there's this voice chat moderation gap, but it's just, it, it, there's this gap in terms of understanding the scope and scale of the problem. 
Absolutely, I agree. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, in practical terms, when we've done some of this work with, with our clients, uh, what we find out is that when you're doing some automatic uh, moderation, you can actually uh, recognize and identify over 10 times more uh, toxic behavior than ever gets gets uh, gets uh, reported. So it's sometimes it's a bit crazy when you're when you're uh, looking at some of those conversations, and pretty much all of the utterances there contain some kind of toxicity. So that's sometimes a bit uh, my ears turn red when hearing some I, of those. I know it's like it's <laughs> terrible. I've listened to a couple of those those things, and and if it was in text chat, a lot of that would be redacted or be captured and like never you know delivered. And so you know I think it's really important now. The question is, okay, so we have all these incidents. So then like, what's what's the impact? How does it manifest itself? So we also ask consumers about that. And a couple of things we want to do is like, we want to talk about like the overall impact. But the other thing we want to know is what happens in the moment? What happens immediately after that happens? Yeah, I think this was one of the most interesting findings because there's been a lot of you know discussion about this in the industry. So when you look at what happens immediately after users have, have actually experienced toxic behavior, 40% they turn off the voice chat, and voice chat is an important feature in the games. 23% of those ones actually stopped playing, but they might have returned, but almost 5% never returned. So that means that that you know 70% of people immediately had a reaction, and only 29 of them were able to shrug it off. Yeah, one of the things I was looking at too is like, so 40% turn off voice chat. So let's just look at that segment. We learned earlier that about half of gamers think games are more fun with voice chat. So, okay, so you turn off voice chat. So you would, you would expect that that gamer's experience might be diminished by the fact that they don't have voice chat on anymore. So not enjoying as much. But what about all the other people who are also playing with that? If it's a multiplayer game, for example. So they're, they're also having a diminished experience because one of the players that was on voice chat is no longer on voice chat. And maybe they're also subject to this toxic behavior. So you just think about like these cascading effects. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. I agree. It's, it's definitely impacting the experience that gamers are getting, getting from their games. It's, you could even say that it's making social games, uh, non-social games. It's removing the social features and the, the whole benefits of those. So that's, that's a shame. Yeah, absolutely. And so in addition to the short-term effects, there's long-term effects as, as well. Yeah, what was really interesting here, because there has been a lot of debate about this in the industry, is that 38% actually permanently decrease their usage. And this means massive implications to, to the financials of these gaming companies. You know, churned users, reduced game, game especially in, in games where monetization is driven by by usage, this is a really alarming number. Yeah, if you think about it, this is self-reporting by consumers. So if we if we think about the fact that you know almost forty percent of these gamers are saying they reduce uh, permanently reduce use, and some percentage of those actually just stop playing the game altogether. Some of them just play it less frequently after this. But then we have you know, essentially half of all gamers who are experiencing these types of things. So like you net out everything. About 20% of gamers are actually reducing their use overall on these titles. And some titles have much higher incidence. So it's not like half of people have experienced uh, voice chat toxicity. Sometimes it's 70 or 80% have had that. And then we're looking at, you know, 40% of them actually reducing use afterwards, trying out other titles, not playing games, whatever it might be. And there's, I, I think it's really interesting that we have this immediate reaction, but then we also have this long-term implication. Agree, agree. So this is, I would call this a uh, industry-wide problem, and it, it's one of the, the biggest problems that the industry is currently facing. Gamer, games, gamers are playing games more socially, online, together with other people, but this is really making it very bad for them. So, so this is something that the industry needs to act up. And, and the gamers, what we found was they want the industry to do something. I, I find that some of the people who are actually making games don't know or don't think it's that big of a problem. Uh, some of them know it's a problem, but they're not really sure what to do. Uh, the game players actually have some ideas on this. And one of the things I thought was really astounding is that about 44%, they want a one-click complaint system that shares the audio recording from that voice chat that had the toxic behavior like immediately. So like this instant feedback. And one of the big game platforms actually does this. Like Sony implemented something very similar to this not too long ago. 
I'm really interested in this in particular because I, I read a lot about things like moderation and privacy and gaming and all these other types of things. And there's a sentiment of a lot of the people, particularly in the gaming industry, that think that, well, maybe we shouldn't record this because there's going to be privacy concerns. And then you look at something like this and what the gamers say is like, no, actually, I want to have something like this. I'm less worried about you violating my privacy with something like this. And I mean, these aren't generally intimate conversations anyway. Let's face it, it's gaming. So, but they, but they, the impact is so significant for them, the toxicity that they want something done. They want that way to provide instant feedback to the game platform and accompany that with some evidence of what actually happened. Yeah, and if you look at these numbers, you can see that 80% of gamers actually want something to be done for this problem. And uh, out of those ones, over half actually want there to be some kind of recording, whether it's a, um, a recording uh, linked to a complaint system or whether it's real-time uh, real voice chat moderation. I think that is pretty pretty interesting. And the fact that 27% of the gamers actually would want to have a real-time voice chat uh, monitoring, I think is pretty pretty big. That means that that gamers actually they would rather want to be able to play their favorite game in peace with their friends without toxic behavior, and they're willing to pay for that by the fact that somebody might listen into their casual conversations there. Um, so I think that there's that the, the issue that has been talked about in the industry is not as as big as as it has been made to seem. Yeah, and, and we we see like actions by some of the game makers over the last year, some of the really high profile ones that have basically said, you know what, we have to do something about this. And what we're finding is that those are not isolated incidents. I think what we found uh, in some of our analysis and some of the things that I know that you've been doing is that it's it, it touches all games. And some of the games you don't even think of, like there's some that everybody knows, I won't name them here, but you can just look up on your favorite gaming website <laughs> about like which ones are most toxic. And you say, oh, geez, we think it's just those first person shooter multiplayer games and stuff like that. It's not. It's like a lot of different places. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting in talking to people in the industry, talking to uh, you and the Speechly team about some things going, is there's actually this, there's actually several models that are being implemented, but almost all of them are one model. And so one of the things we were looking about is like, okay, so if you have voice chat moderation, what is it? Like, what do you have? How does that compare to other things? And we sort of looked at this idea of like time to action, like when an incident happens, like how quickly can you respond? And then the amount of data for investigation. And this is really interesting because almost every company in the space is in that lower left-hand corner. It's complaint-driven systems and they actually have no evidence. It, the only thing they have to go on is what the, the you know, victim said was something they can go on. And one of the other things that we know is that uh, something like um, two thirds of people in the space uh, actually say they've had a false complaint levied against them. And so how does the game platform know? And a lot of them basically say, we can't do anything. We can take this up. If we get a lot of complaints then, you know, about a particular person, then maybe we can take some action. But since there's this high incidence of of false reporting, what are we going to do? Now, there's a couple other models as well. So we have this re recordings. We you mentioned like the Sony example. That's really good. And actually, one of the things that I've learned through conversations with people in the industry is actually some of that false complaining uh, actually went down. Went down. Those false complaints went down because oh, obviously now that you have the evidence, like you're not going to just take my word for it, and maybe you'll see that I'm I'm actually the perpetrator. So that's been really useful. Um, Almost nobody, but some people are like doing audio and then just at, keeping the transcription. And th that can actually be also good because then you can go back later. This might be, become particularly, I think, beneficial as more games companies are thinking about doing transparency reports. Um, there's also the DSA legislation or regulations that are coming in in Europe, which might require something like this. So I'm starting to see like maybe there will be something here. And then like a very, very small percentage are doing real time voice chat monitoring, which is actually something that you know one in four of the gamers thought would be actually really beneficial here so as you think about the market and what you've learned over the years what is your perspective 
Yeah, so so one of the reasons why the, the gaming companies uh, have been not investing in doing anything proactively has been the fact that the technology has not been there and it's been prohibitively expensive. Now, this has changed during the last couple of years. And as a matter of fact, uh, um, we were actually pulled when we were in YC uh, last year into this space because we actually had the technology that could solve the problem. Uh, as our technology, it can be deployed on premise, it can be deployed on, on device, um, it can um, provide a significantly better accuracy than the cloud-based systems, and it can also um, solve the problems very cost effectively, you know, 75 to 95 percent more cost effectively than the cloud solution. So, so we were pretty much pulled into this space. And and um, in the in the cost side, what made it so prohibitive was that when the cloud services they charge you around one dollar per hour. If you use that to to uh, process gamer voice chat, it's just insane. The unit economics just don't work. So you have to find another reason, and that's because there has been such a different ballpark in the numbers. That's why gaming companies have totally this missed uh, ASR as a solution for this problem. But now when the technology has advanced, now we're starting to see the most innovative uh, gaming companies actually building systems for monitoring voice chats in real time. And they're seeing massive impact on reduced toxicity there. And that's something that I'm expecting that's going to really be proliferated in the industry. And in one to two uh, years time, it will be as, as widely spread as text chat moderation is today. Yeah. And and I've seen some of the results that you have around gym class and some of your other customers. It, it, it is significant and it's actually eye-opening when you look at how bad this situation is compared to what people think it is because they just go to these complaint models. But then like how quickly it actually turns around if you just have some basic tools. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting, you know, just knowing this space around the cloud models is the cloud models are generalized models. And what you learn very quickly, and the people who are doing text chat moderation learned this a long time ago, is that you need some sort of custom model for a game because every game has different terminology. It's not the terminology that we use in everyday conversation, which is what the generalized cloud models are for. It's specific to that game, and a lot of them are specific to the culture of that game. And so ultimately, you can only get high accuracy, you know, really high accuracy, and understand the context of what's being said if you have a custom model. Yes, exactly. And in addition to, to being able to uh, accurately uh, transcribe everything that is being spoken, what's also very important in artificial intelligence kind of automated systems is the fact that in, in addition to accuracy recall, what's really important is false positive rates. Because when you are doing a, building a system where the AI is the one who is actually flagging uh, user bad behavior, um, so you were already mentioning before that there are these false accusations. So when the false accusation is done by a person, it's it's something. But when the false accusation is done by an AI, that's that's worse. So what's very important when building these custom models is that, of course, maximizing the domain accuracy of the of the gaming um, terminology, but also minimizing the false positive rates. And anybody who has been into machine learning know that that uh, solving these two things there's an inherent trade-off, and that's that's something where you really need to build some sort sophisticated custom models. And that's that's also one of the reasons why we have been we have been called to the rescue by many of these companies in this space. <laughs> All right. So I think this is the voice chat moderation gap. People don't have tools, uh, but there are tools now. And uh, looks like they can be cost effective. And like we think about this aver average revenue per user that's so important, ARPU, uh, to the game makers. And like we talked about this issue of churn and people in reduced play. Those impact that. So these trade-offs have always been, so what's the cost to implement this? What's the impact if we don't implement it? And it seems like we're sort of hitting that sweet spot right now where with some custom models with deployments on-prem that you can actually cost-effectively address the problem, help your reputational issues, help your word of mouth, all those other types of things, and you know, generally give a better game experience to the user and then better economics for the game maker. Absolutely. The technology has changed dramatically even in the last year. And today the technology is ready. Uh, so, and that's, that's also why many of the large gaming companies are currently experimenting with these technologies and building something. So, so there will be some, some very interest, interesting launches coming up soon. So exciting times ahead.
Absolutely. Okay, Otto, this has been great. Thanks so much. It was really fun to talk about what's going on in voice chat moderation, different use case than a lot of people have come across for automated speech recognition. How can people learn more about what Speechly is doing in the space? So come to the Speechly website, speechly.com. There's a lot of interesting uh, stuff there, uh, including the, the report we were referring to that, that was bought uh, um, uh, research for us. Uh, download that. Uh, follow us on on LinkedIn, in Twitter, and uh, reach out if you if you want to know more about uh, speech recognition, voice moderation, and voice chat toxicity. Awesome, Otto Soderlund. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Brett. Thanks for having me.